Good afternoon, Sachin. A uh, warm welcome to you on behalf of APAC News Network. Uh, just uh, very briefly, uh, we are a media organization headquartered out of Noida and uh, presence in across India as well as in Dubai, Singapore and Malaysia. So primarily uh, we focus on technology across government, healthcare, education, BFSI, uh, and startups is one a big segment uh, that we focus on. Uh, and uh, we are involved in uh, even different uh, startup outreach programs also. So primarily the discussion, uh, what uh, we would like today is uh, one to understand uh, the AWS uh, digital native business, primarily the startup business its different nuances and sort of uh, facets within it. So maybe the best way to start would be uh, if you can uh, just for all the viewers explain uh, how are the startup companies categorized within the AWS uh, native digital business? Thanks. Sure. Sure, Rajneesh. Thanks a lot for having me here, first of all, and pleasure to be talking to you uh, today. Um, so the way we AWS classifies, uh, you know, the startup business is primarily into three, three different segments. You know, there is uh, what we call a digital native segment. Um, there's the other one which we call in ISVs, which is the software vendors. And then the third one, what we call the startup segment. Now the difference between the two, this three is, uh, the, the DNB and ISVs are really the um, what you call uh, name segments or uh, so to say the latest stage startups, you know, the latest stage startups who scaled, who, which who, the, the ones they've already found the product market fit and are already operating at a certain scale are part of DNB and ISVs. The difference between DNB and ISV again is DNBs is basically B2C and um, ISVs are B2B. Um, so that's the difference between DNB and ISV. And then, you know, the startup segment is where we have all the basically thousands of startups, which is the scale motion. And those are usually the early stage startups that sit in the startup segment. So that's how we classify this, you know, into three, three different buckets. Okay, thanks. So just a little bit more clarification on this categorization especially between the DNV and the ISVs, which you mentioned. Uh, ISVs is um, obviously more on the software side, but uh, you also mentioned about one criteria being uh, a startup, which is particularly a B2C uh, sort of organization and uh, one which has a more B2B kind of target. So my question is for many of the startups, maybe it will be a hybrid uh, both B2B and B2C might be there, uh, and that's most cases are likely. So in that case, uh, how do you classify uh, them? And is this B2B, B2C the sort of primary uh, criteria for categorization? Yeah, so, so usually um, it's, it's a clear demarcation, right? So for example, a B2C startups, if I say in the DNB segment will be um, you know, if I take gaming, there'll be customers like 24 cross 7, Games 24 cross 7, or Dream 11, or MPL. And if I take the fintech space, it'll be, you know, it'll be customers like Paytm or Razorpay or PayU. However, you know, if I compare the same with B2B, B2B will be, will be, will be uh, different. You know, it's, it'll be mostly um, customers like Clevertap, for example. Uh, so the so the customers who are in the business of providing solutions in a B two B fashion get classified as ISVs, and for the customers which have a primarily business which is dealing with the consumer gets classified as B two C and part of the DMB segment. I hope that clarifies. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. So now uh, coming, um, let's focus on both the DNB and the ISV here, if I may say. Uh, in terms of uh, AWS helping out and specifically more the uh, companies under DNBs, uh, one, uh, one is in terms of uh, their technology adoption or deployment 
uh, in terms of the choice of technology, uh, maybe helping in terms of manageability and deployment. That is one part of technology wise. And second is in terms of uh, helping in their business development. Uh, that can be marketing, uh, the Marcom, and even uh, further go ahead uh, in actual business development. So what are the initiatives that AWS has, uh, which sort of acts as a support program for these under the DNB business? Sure. So, um, you know, we have a number of programs that helps both on, you know, on both the contours that you just mentioned, Rajneesh, uh, to help uh, startups get off the block and, and, you know, move to cloud and scale on cloud and, and, and so on and so forth. If I have to classify, you know, these stages, I'll classify these these uh, startups into three buckets, you know, uh, an early stage or a, or a mid stage, where I, which, which we call a scaling stage. And the third is the maturity, you know, when the startups are not really matured. So if you look at the early stage startups, we have a number of programs. For example, we have program, our flagship program called AWS um, Activate, where we help startups with uh, tech support training and also um, you know a number of credits for them to get off the block and start on AWS. Uh, to give you an idea, uh, last year itself, um, you know AWS gave about a billion dollars of credits, you know through through this program. And um, you know in the last seven years, we've given almost about three point five billion dollars of credits, you know to to startups to get you know off the block and start on cloud. Um, we also have a program called, you know, uh, Migrate, you know, where we help startups uh, if they are on DKC platforms uh, or in-house or on a data center, Colo, uh, to help them migrate from those data centers to cloud. So that's for the early stage startup. You know, as the startup mature and they go into the mid stage, uh, their the requirements and their the kind of support they need is a little different. Um, so they... You know, they may need more tech support, you know, operational support. They may, they may need more architectural support. You know, they may need support with respect to new services like machine learning or data analytics and, you know, architect them and help them architect those, those solutions. Um, and they may need help with training. And they also need help with cost, you know, because as you start to scale on cloud, how to architect well, how to stay efficient, and how do we work with them to uh, keep the cost down. So we have a number of programs and, and support, you know, and resources that work with them um, in that in, in uh, during that phase for all of these areas. As they mature, you know, they, you know, and they start to scale more and they start to look for new geographies and, you know, new markets and so on and so forth. There's where we help with them with a number of other programs, like we have the, you know, enterprise program, where in a typical roundtable fashion, we get the startups to go and meet um, a number of CTOs or CXOs or CMOs, depending on, you know, what their uh, persona that they're targeting and uh, arrange those, uh, you know, enterprise connects um with those with those uh, with those companies you know for example we last year we've done more than 700 uh, connects uh, uh, for these startups uh, across across the globe okay so uh, in that early phase uh, where you mentioned uh, and where you help them migrate uh, from whatever data center they had uh, to an uh, aws cloud my question is, uh, even before that early stage, uh, what were the criteria in selecting? Fine, I understood it's a B2C companies in DNB, but it's not that any B2C startup can come under the business. So in terms of uh, even uh, if I may say before the early development, what were the criteria under which those uh, companies itself were selected in the DNB portfolio and then uh, since we're shifting them to the AWS cloud, is that a sort of a mandatory thing uh, that uh, the tech platform has to be on AWS cloud or it can be on any cloud uh, but still uh, come under DNB? Yeah, so there are certain criteria uh, which are, you know, as I said, so there is also, so, so first of all, there is any startup can work with AWS, you know, so we also have, as I said, a startup segment, you know, which where, you know, the number of startups who, 
who, who we work with and they can go and avail the program like it AWS Activate, which I just spoke about, or also AWS Migrate. Um, the, 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 which startups are part of DNB is based on, as I said, these are usually later stage of the funding. They're usually yeah, based on the complexity of the tech architecture. Um, you know, they're usually the, the startups which have scaled to a certain extent and, um, you know, need much more deeper, um, um, much more deeper relationship, much more deeper collaboration and partnership from AWS. And those are the ones that are part of the new segment. And some of the names that I told you earlier. Yeah. And uh, so one critical part, again, as they have, as you said, uh, those uh, organizations which have sort of reached uh, some sort of critical mass. Uh, yeah. Now, one uh, critical thing still for them for their further development is uh, obviously business development, but more in terms of having a specific go-to-market strategy for their target segments. Now, how does AWS help? Uh, is there a joint uh, go-to-market or, uh, um, or uh, do some of these similar kind of organization work in a consortium? Uh, supported by AWS, and how does the go-to model, go-to market uh, model for these companies work, and where does AWS come in? Yeah, so we do have a number of programs through which I said, for example, one I said the Enterprise Connect program, right, where if there are startups who are willing to sell to enterprises, we'll you know help facilitate and make those connections. We also have. Um, you know, if you've heard about AWS Marketplace. So, you know, if you have a solution, uh, you can go and, you know, um, you can go and register and be in, in the Marketplace. In Marketplace today, we have more than 300,000 active customers. Uh, and we have products listed and solutions listed in more than 50 categories. So, you know, if I am a DNB and I'm seeking one, you know, a solution, um, and I can go to a marketplace and I can actually go and procure that solution and in a similar fashion that I procured AWS and, um, you, know, you know, use the solution, deploy that solution, use that solution. You know, for example, a lot of, lot of, lot of the partners that we work with, companies like Snowflake or Databricks or New Relic, you know, part of marketplace and a lot of our DNB customers would go and consume that, you know, from the marketplace. So that's another way you know, for organizations, um, um, you know, the way we partner with them and give them access to a very broad set of customers. As I said, there are more than 300,000 active customers which means that consume through the marketplace. And uh, uh, thanks. And uh, another question is, uh, many of these organizations, their uh, target markets uh, would be uh, geography agnostic, it would be across uh, different geographies. Uh, so, as and as they are part of the DNB business, how uh, internally, in terms of uh, uh, sort of how is it structured within AWS? Because uh, a customer who can be part of uh, AWS DNB business in one geography uh, might be um, might have customers in another geography, and so they would be availing of some of these. Um, marketplace features or in another geography. So how does that reconciliation and that structure within that uh, work out? So see, for us, it's customer is always at the center, right? We work backward from customer and uh, it uh, it doesn't matter, you know, to your point, if if the customer is in India or if, you know, they, they have another, they have a business in US or any other country, we all work collaboratively to support the customer in their interest and uh, do what's right for them, Rajneesh. No, what I uh, was uh, trying to get more that the customer uh, part is fine. Uh, say, uh, say there is one startup, uh, it's an US startup. And it's part of the AWS business uh, uh, from uh, the D DNB business in AWS US. Now, um, because that customer might be having a market here in India, uh, it might require a lot of tech support uh, to be provided by the DNB business of AWS India. So then this, uh, when this cross geography uh, 
if I may say, um, relationship uh, need to be maintained? How does that happen? Yeah, so as I said, you know, the, the good news is that we have regions, you know, all across the globe, right? So, you know, we have about about uh, 25 regions now and 81, uh, you know, about 81 available, sorry, 81 availability zones. And um, so, so a customer is free to deploy where they want. So let's say if a customer in the US is coming to India and they want to deploy um, the setup in India, they can choose the India region and, and deploy it. And um, if they need need tech support, there are teams available from you know whether it's account managers, or solution architects, or technical account managers, or professional services. All teams are available for any support that they need to scale in India. And as I said, you know, in that case, we work very collaboratively with with the teams in the US and and provide them the right support. Okay, and uh, also in terms of, uh, so now uh, these uh, uh, startup organizations uh, will be coming from different domains. Okay, they might be B2C, but even within B2C, it can be a fintech or it can be an edtech or health tech or whatever. Uh, so now, and each will have their own uh, domain business dynamics. Now, in uh, that will uh, even determine in some cases the tech support and the go-to market that needs to be provided. So my question is, even uh, for the DNB business, uh, is the focus uh, completely the support um, is done on an individual level for a specific company, or maybe uh, say certain common functions? Uh, for companies in a particular domain. So uh, there are uh, certain uh, common practices uh, from AWS that those companies can follow. How does the model work? Or is it like each company, irrespective of their domain, is a complete separate entity for a AWS? Yeah. So see, the uh, because DNB customers are, uh, you know, at a certain scale, um, you know, let me let me also give you some flavor on. So these customers at a certain scale, they have have you know they they have uh, large tech teams. Most of them are cloud native, understand cloud really well, and um, you know, um, as I said, they have the expertise to work on cloud. A lot of our um, our engagement with them is really really deep. You know, which means we working with them. Um, it's not about the basic services around storage or compute and how to use, you know, some of them. Um, I think they're very good. You know, those are table stake. They're very good at doing it themselves. It's really about innovation. It's really about a lot about, uh, you know, solving business problems. You know, to give you give you an example, um, you know, we worked with uh, one of our customers, uh, which is Zomato. Um, they were looking to. Uh, digitize a lot of, you know, digitize these menus, you know, of, of the restaurants. Now that's a very hard task. Uh, you know, you have to take those physical menus and look look at those menus and um, able to extract the the text from the images and also be able to structure the text from the images, right? And then so uh, we work with them collaboratively with what we have we call machine learning labs. So we have machine learning labs in India uh, where we have data scientists and you know machine machine learning experts. So we worked with them uh, using a solutions of TextTrack and you know um, SageMaker to create that model of digitizing that menu. And so that's so, so that's a problem. You know that's the kind of uh, um, uh, problems that we work on day to day basis for them. Let me give you another example. Which is, you know, uh, one of our customers, which is Punch, which is a digital marketing agency. Now they uh, were using a database, uh, which was, uh, um, uh, which which they were not able to scale. You know, they were not able to run campaigns because the moment they run campaigns, they you know they were not able to scale the database. And you know, so they came to us and we worked with them to to migrate that to some, the modern. Each, you know the, the today's databases like a document DB, uh, where they could then you know scale um, the data handling capacity increased by almost two x, and they could say at the same time save twenty percent of the cost. So a lot of our engagement is you know around innovation, uh, around solving business use cases, 
and uh, it is very deep engagement though there are certain nuances that needs to be say okay this is the vf fintech customers uh, you know uh, where some of the scale problems can be can be used for, for by all for example you know during pandemic the whole problem around kyc became an issue you know so we worked with uh, some of our uh, fintech customers and some of our gaming customers on how do we do the ekyc bit you know how do we bring accuracy in reading those um ids you know and um, do ekyc online so we build that model for for these customers which can now be deployed across you know different different uh, across the fintech or across gaming so there's certain horizontal things which we do there also there is a lot of personalized one on one problem solving that we do with each customer okay thanks uh, and you uh, brought the issue it was my next question give one example of the ekyc done during uh, the pandemic uh what i wanted to ask next is what we have seen uh primarily as you uh, rightly said uh, all these customers are cloud native or sort of born in the cloud businesses and their businesses uh most of the services they are rendering have been uh, online even uh before the pandemic but what we have seen uh, during the pandemic is uh, more so their uh, one the internal operation also uh, got uh, moved to the cloud as well as their service delivery uh, was uh, completely happening on cloud so my question is like the ekyc is one use case that you mentioned other than that uh in case uh, wherever pandemic impacted uh, the mode of business of your customers uh, how did aws sort of help uh, yeah. and uh, sort of smoothen that uh, transition during the pandemic yeah so see i mean um, um, uh, i'll put it this way there are two kind of businesses right there's a kind of there were businesses who got the tailwind during covid there were businesses law businesses got headwind during covid and in both cases you know uh, customers who were on cloud on aws fared much better than the ones that were not let me give you some um, some insight there you know for example um, during covid there were businesses which got a lot of tailwind for example gaming customers you know gaming became as an escapism when you're sitting at home and a lot of people Uh, downloaded games and started playing games and and you know so you the 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 traffic suddenly spiked the same thing happened you know with the food delivery you know or grocery for example you know one of our customers is big big basket that point during point pandemic saw almost 6x the traffic uh, daily traffic you know compared to um, pre covid times now for those customers it was very easy for them to scale out you know given that you're in cloud they were able to scale out they were able to innovate on some of the solutions that they wanted to and you know didn't face could satisfy the customers and you can could work with them but at the same time there were customers at on the other side which had a lot of headwinds for example a lot of our customers around uh, travel you know where travel totally stopped now a lot of times the, the 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 good things about cloud are talked about scalability but you know um, what you also have to know that a lot of those customers could actually sh- shrink the capacity which means because of the nature of the cloud they could really optimize you know and they could really you know if your traffic drop to 1/10 they can actually go and get their infra to 1/10 and save the cost so you know that's another example of how you know cloud helped them in in this situation a lot of customers also for example i was talking about big basket you know they really used uh, that time to also uh, move from a monolithic based architecture to a microservices based based architecture using containers you know so using some of our services like ecs and eks and um, you know they fully containerized the services to 60 microservices um, and and so on and so forth and you know just to give you an idea so a uh, big basket scaled from about 250000 um, daily orders to about 400000 daily orders in just a span of eight months that time and that could only happen because of cloud okay so uh, you mentioned some names but specifically if i may ask uh, 
what's the total number of customers in the DNB business and how many of them will have reached that matured phase kind of thing right now? Yeah, I don't think um, it'll be difficult for me to give the exact number, but I would say most of the customers in the DNB, DNB segment are in that maturity stage, you know, and uh, uh, these customers are looking, uh, as I said, they are operating in cloud for most part of it. Um, and they are really innovating and adopting services around machine learning, AI, or databases, or containers, or data analytics, and, and so on and so forth. So, uh, like you uh, mentioned, some of the big names like Bigbasket or Zomato or uh, even Dream11, you mentioned, and uh, lots of these names. So, uh, and what rightly happened is uh, you are talking about a lot of these microservices got added. Uh, you helped them in the containerization. But my question is uh, now uh, many of these companies being born in the cloud were or already quite tech savvy and they had uh, substantial technology teams already. So uh, how is that coordination? And especially in the pandemic when uh, it might not be always scaling up, but uh, that uh, transformation uh, to do the business was required. So how was the integration with the AWS uh, team uh, with their tech teams and uh, how does that happen? How Do you think does it specifically during the time of, con uh, of COVID? Uh, during the time of COVID is specific because uh, that's more uh, uh, the fast and dynamic changes were required at that time. That's why I'm saying Otherwise, even how is the AWS, how does the AWS team integrate with the tech teams of yeah. these? Um, yeah. So, yeah. So as I said, it's a very, very deep personalized motion for us. You know, um, our, um, we, our relationship with these customers is pretty deep. You know, the, our coverage is very, very deep. You know, as I said, uh, we'll typically have an account manager and NSA and, you know, CSMs and technical account managers, uh, specialist sales, all of them working very, very closely with the tech teams of these, of these uh, customers, uh, working to, you know, um, problem solve, uh, uh, problem solve the sh business issues, look at the future, you know, design architecture for the future, uh, talk about scalability, talk about security, you know, all of that. It's uh, it's almost like we're working, you know, we're an extended arm of, of these companies and we, we're working with them like a true partner. And uh, um, the discussions are happening every day, uh, you know, we, uh, for hours and hours. And uh, it's a very, very deep level of motion, Rajneesh. Okay, so uh, as you are saying, you are almost an extended arm of these companies. So I wanted to understand, say, uh, again, as you mentioned, they are in the three phase, early phase and more or less mid-level to the mature level. Uh, while I understand that depends on the nature of their own business and how they scale up, but how uh, has, as an extended arm, EWS helping uh, companies in the early stages to move to the subsequent stages, mid-level, and then finally mature. What uh, particular actions or initiatives AWS takes to help them so that that whole process uh, of them moving between stages gets accelerated? Yeah. So as I said, you know, the, the, the multiple areas that we work with them, you know, one is the area around, around this tech support, you know, so um, as, as, as the company move from different phases, there you know the need for the kind of support they need from us on tech is different. You know, for example, um, when the companies are crossing that chasm from early to mid, one of the things that they start to look at is cost. You know, and uh, cost becomes extremely important. It's also specifically, for example, in times of um, the COVID, you know, cost becomes very important, became very important because, you know, everybody wanted to extend their runway. And um, there's where, you know, for example, we work with customers 
on uh, reducing their cost and we have a program you know where a lot of customers subscribe to what we call enterprise support and enterprise support is where we give them a dedicated technical account manager who works with them uh, not only on you know looking and running efficiently in cloud which is on cost but also on things around you know do they have the right security posture um, are they architected well you know are you using the services the way you, you should use you know um, are you using the levers that we have around savings plan and RIs and and things around those? So you know it's 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 about cost. It's about the right level of security. It's about are you architected well? All of that you know is when we, you know uh, the assistance that we provide. We also work with them, you know, when they have large scale events. So a lot of them have will have large scale events. You may have a Diwali sale or you may have. Uh, you know, IPL coming or, or things like those, right? So there is also when we work with them and make sure that those large scale events go really, really well. So it's it it depends on each customer, which stage they are, what level of support they, they need. Um, and they may need, for example, also support around adopting some of our new services. So we work with them in solving those those issues, like the example I gave, so Somato, um, and uh, working with them to problem solve it, do POCs, make sure that the solution is successful, and so on and so forth. Okay. And uh, another thing I wanted to understand, earlier we talked about, I understood the criteria for selection, but uh, beyond that, uh, how does AWS as an organization, and especially the DNB business, go about hunting for these, uh, uh, if I may say, new, newer customers, these entities? Uh, how do you look out for them? What is the DNB's uh, specific GTM, if I may ask? Well, so for 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 us, as I said, um, you know, for AWS, we we are working with the you know the whole startup ecosystem um, in a very very deep fashion. You know, uh, we work and we work across the complete life cycle of the startup, right? From the time they are incubated and they're part of an accelerator or you know funded by a VC or and so on and so forth, and we start working with them at that stage, and we stay with them, you know, till the journey of of being a DNB or also being an IPO company like Sumato is now, right? So we stay with them across the across the full life cycle, and at different stages, right? So at a certain stage, we may feel that this startup needs a different kind of. Uh, they have reached a scale. They have reached a tech complexity where they need a different level of support from us is when we move those startups, you know, from that startup segment to the DNB segment, and then, you know, to give them the right level of support and coverage that, that they need. So um, it's really for us, it's the whole life life cycle in the journey, and we stay with them from start to, to maternity. Okay, so uh, it's primarily uh, from the startups of only uh, once they reach a certain level of maturity, then they are moved to the DNB business. Uh, another thing, a little uh, future looking, if I may ask, uh, what is the trend that you are witnessing in terms of uh, startups? Some obvious examples during the pandemic you mentioned was games and uh, I would presume education also because, but beyond that also, as we look forward, uh, what sort of uh, the nature of startups and uh, which you uh, feel uh, would be maturing and move to, if I may say, your DNB business? So, what sort of companies you are expecting to see more there? Yeah, um, it's a very broad question, but I think there are certain domains which are really very hot, right? FinTech is definitely one. There's a lot of work happening on FinTech around different areas like insurance or wealth tech or um or even on the um, uh, even on the capital capital side so um, you know specifically a lot of focus on areas around bnpa which is by now a lot of innovation happening you know and there to extend credit to people which you know were never in the credit system right? there's so many people who are never in the credit system how do you extend credit to them so i think that that domain is is a really really 
uh, is really, really hot. Um, uh, ed tech is, is second. I think COVID has taught all of us. Um, a lot of the things can be done uh, remotely and uh, you know we've seen the tailwinds on 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 that on that side and i think that will continue uh, and you know there is so much of a skill gap you know digital skill gap in our country that uh, i think that field is it will continue to be hot and you know just because the demand is so much i think that second um i think gaming another one you know gaming we are at just at uh, i think we're just getting started if you see across the globe with some of the very matured countries where the where gaming is matured i think we are at the tip of the iceberg right now and um, that field also will gain momentum uh, in the next few years uh, rajneesh Okay, and uh, lastly, I would uh, like to ask uh, from an AWS perspective, uh, what and uh, from an AWS DNB perspective, what are going to be your key focus areas for the next few quarters, three, four quarters, if I may ask? Yeah. So I think for us, um, you know, we would continue to work with customers. Uh, around uh, as i said on co-innovation on, on innovating with them and focus on some of the areas around ai and machine learning i think we have the most comprehensive stack there um, and um, i think in the future what will happen is most applications will be fused with some you know some level of ai machine learning right and some level of ai will be built in all the apps so i think that's one area for sure which is a focus for us uh, you know, working with the customer, as I said, it's, we have the most comprehensive stack, whether you have machine learning experts or not, you know, uh, we have three layers, you know, and we have solution like SageMaker, where it does all the heavy lifting, even if you don't have machine learning practitioners. And then we have the higher level AI, AI services also, right, which you can just consume. Uh, uh, and we support most of the frameworks. So, uh, so that's, I think, an area, definitely. I think the second area is um, we see... Um, a lot of the organizations move from uh, traditional one database fit all application um, to a purpose built database for the application, right? Because the applications are totally changed, the amount of data that they handle is totally changed, the response time is different. I mean, it's a different world. Uh, and, you know, today we offer more than 15 flavors of databases. and. Uh, you know, so you can't solve everything with a SQL database. So there's no SQL database. And let's say if you're solving a problem around fraud, you know, you can um, actually solve it using a graph database because, you know, graph database somewhere you make different connections and, you know, you the connection can tell a lot about people and so on and so forth. So I think that's def that's also the second area where, you know, uh, where we, we definitely focused. Um, I think the third area will be around uh, uh, data analytics, you know, where um, uh, it's just becoming, it's just, bec it's, it's just become more and more uh, clear now that, you know, you, we all are data organization, you can't operate without data. And, you know, how do you uh, help organizations create that data lake and, you know, and, um, get all the structure and unstructured data in one place and make insights in as much real time as you can, right? So, so you know, the solutions around that is another one. Um, and I think fourthly, containers will stay hot anyway because for the next two, three years because that's the way for, for organizations to move from a monolithic architecture to a microservices-based architecture. And, you know, there's where we also have a very comprehensive stack, um, you know, if, uh, if you need Kubernetes, we have EKS, if you uh, want some, you know, want a container service, managed container service, which is closer to AWS services, you can use ECS. We also have Fargate, which is our serverless offering. So I think that's another area. So these four areas, I think, is, is that comes to my mind. I hope you, I hope I was able to give you what you were looking for. Sure, definitely. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Aitnish. Take care. Bye.